So my name is Daljit Nagra. Um, I've published three collections of poetry, all with Faber and Faber. I used to be a full-time teacher, and now I work a couple of days at a secondary school. And the rest of my time is really uh, spent running workshops for adults and giving readings at schools, universities and art centres in Britain and abroad. Hi, I'm Rowan, the interviewer. If you were teaching a class on poetic voice, where would you begin? Po poetic voice is really interesting. Cause I think if we think about voice, I think the first thing that strikes me about voice is attitude. That voice is about attitude. So, for example, if I was thinking uh, I don't know, about a cup of tea, if I was going to write a poem about a cup of tea, the attitude I take informs the voice. So I might talk about, in terms of tea, I don't know, the British Empire. Um, and suddenly I'm taking on an historical attitude to a cup of tea. I might write a poem about having a cup of tea at a picnic and just having a, enjoying a really lovely summer's afternoon, which might be more whimsical uh, and maybe a pastoral take on on a cup of tea. So suddenly, already, you know, already the attitudes inform the, the way the voice is kind of developed. And then within that, I might, if I was talking about a cup of tea still, um, I might, you know, the way I write that poem might be very angry or I might be ironic or sarcastic or, you know, just very heartfelt earnest. And that maybe is a second layer of that voice. So not only the attitude I'm taking to the thing, the, the lens I approach with, but how I also look at it within that, my tone within that. So I think voice is primarily about personality, what your personality is and how, it's, um, how it approaches a subject. Uh, which is which is good news, I think, for a writer because hopefully no two writers are the same. So our little kind of takes on anything might be slightly different. So I might might have a psychological take on something which is quite sincere, or psychological, quite dry, or historical and quite sarcastic, um, or you know flimsy, uh, whimsical, and uh, but you know with a different tone. So um, first thing I'd encourage people is to start thinking about what their own personality is uh, as a poet. And the way to probably do that is not to think dryly, but is to try and write some poems, just write poems about various subjects and see what comes up. Because I think we're always surprised um, by what comes out. And, I, and, and having taught poetry for years, I found that people are never, um, I, I find that people never actually are the person they think they're going to be in the poem. They think they're a very serious person or quite a jokey poem person, quite a jokey person or a very serious person. Then something completely different happens on the page because suddenly they're in a relationship with something very internal, which is very uh, inchoate, which we don't always know about, whether it's unconscious or, um, or very personal. And that's the excitement of the poetic voice. So that's my first kind of tip. Get writing and see what happens, what comes out. And watch that voice develop over years. It's not just about developing over a few days. Your poems seem to locate so much of their sensibility in spoken dialect. Did that come naturally to you? Yeah, I think my attitude to the spoken voice developed over time. When I first started writing poems, I was trying to write um, these third-person poems about Indians living in Britain. I wanted to write about the migration experience, first generation in Britain, and the second generation, their relationship with each other. And what I was doing, first of all, possibly was just sort of in a detached way, trying to describe what those Indians are like. And actually what I found it was better for me to do was to go into first person and create their voices. And then the problem for me then was, I didn't feel I could do justice to their voices because they were my background, people in my background aren't very fluent English speakers. Uh, many of them can't speak very good English at all. My, my mum speaks hardly any English. So I, th I felt kind of um, free from the burden of translation. I thought I'm just going to make up some voices for these characters. So I tried to create these kind of slightly kind of mock English voices that are part English and part something else. So hopefully the voice is always gesturing towards being standard English, but always moving off to, and suggesting to us there's another voice there. Um, but I, I mean, that may be an over technical interpretation of the voice, but the key thing was I wanted to capture the spirit of life or energy of those characters. So the first thing was to, to gauge how these people speak 
and how you want to capture what you want, what aspects of the voice you want to capture. And for me, it was trying to capture the noise because when my relatives sit together, even though they're sat next to each other, they shout. That's just their way of talking. They're very loud. So for me, I thought I'm going to try and create really loud voices um, as a way of really doing justice to the spirit, the feel, the mood of that kind of culture. In terms of developing your own inner ear, uh, in terms of delicacy and indelicacies of, of the kind of ordinary speak, I think the first thing is probably to trust your own instincts that in your life that you've lived so far, you've, you've absorbed so many different voices, so many different sounds. And part of the confidence comes from, or, or part of the skill comes from having the confidence to know that you've absorbed these voices, that if you have a go at some of these accents and, and sounds, something uh, incredible could happen. Um, and also maybe also being alert um, to the forms and traditions of poetry. So if you're going to, if you're thinking of um, writing a long line, you need to think about um, why I'm, why am I doing a long line in terms of the poetic ear? Am I after somebody who talks very fast and talks a lot, or do I want to capture somebody who doesn't actually say much? Is quite spare. I might do slightly shorter lines, um, or or learning how to be free in say an iambic pentameter line, how to create freedom uh, of a natural voice, whether it be an accent voice. Uh, a regional voice or just a standard English voice, how to find freedom. Because you can't just replicate the kind of voice out on the street because it will just it might sound a bit boring, so you need to find ways to concentrate it. So the forms help as well. So it's probably an intersection of um, the lived voice against the artificial voice of form, whether it would be free verse or I don't know, sonnet or villanelle or sestina. Is there a writer whose vocal sensibilities you particularly admire? Jo Shapcott, who's a contemporary poet, and um, she's published a few collections. Um, and one one of the things I like about her voice is it's quite slippery. So it, it appears she appears to be appears to be um, saying things in a very direct, earnest way. But when you look closely at the words, she's not always saying what you think she's saying, and she shifts between appearing to be very earnest um, and very emotional to actually just withdrawing. Um, and I think that's very lifelike as well. And, and her voices sort of shift ever so slightly, delicately, from poem to poem. So there's never this just one voice that's always the same. So I would recommend Joe Shapcott, who's a wonderful poet, I think, um, and who's a contemporary and who teaches, actually, as well. And I sort of work alongside her at Faber Academy. And I know she teaches at Royal Holloway on the MA and PhD course as well. You said you might honour us with a reading? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to read a poem from my second collection, uh, Tipu Sultan's Incredible White Man Eating Tiger Toy Machine. And the poem is um, a, a sonnet. So I want to have a kind, of, uh, a kind of uncouth take on the sonnet, which is, you know, the kind of Rolls Royce of the English poetry form. Um, but I haven't been kind of horrible or aggressive or anything. I just want to... Um, role play some anti-macho behaviour in the sonnet and in, I guess in traditional sonnets the male is always gazing at the female here and, and you know and confidently gazing at the female here I just want to put the, 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 the male under some anxiety so it's po this poem is called Fallacy that's spelled with PH rather than F so Fallacy How oft do mates bang on at length about the length they're hung and grab their crotch to slash the air, then chuck an arm at will around a chum while necking Stella till they're lashed. To tell the truth, I'm really not well hung, and thus I hide from mates my prince's state. This conch is king of my poor frame, no trunks would lunchbox find to bank a lady's gaze. And yet, I hope the guys won't feel too down when I recount my lover's hardly wimpish watch her stiffen over cause from louts who check her out too long, for she's that fit. In bed, most nights, she'll sigh. Oh, love. 
I love the woman's way you work your subtle touch. For more updates and videos, either follow Inky Dumbbell's YouTube channel or follow me on Twitter at RowanHLB. See you soon.